It doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe they didn't want to. As long as I can hear. Can't even. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello, welcome to Think Tech, and welcome to Understanding China. Here we are in Honolulu, and we have some uh, friends from Beijing that we're going to be speaking to you live. Understanding China is about explaining the great ancient kingdom of China and the modern revolution that it has made of itself and for its people and how that revolution is affecting 1.4 billion people in China and by extension is affecting the whole world, all of us. So uh, politically, economically, culturally, in the arts, this is all about understanding China from the point of view of the leaders of China. And today we have a return visit from uh, uh, our guest in the previous episode and I asked a question to Lin Fan Lin, who is the executive director, the CEO of a large media company in Beijing, uh, Beijing Emoza. And I asked him, Fan Lin, what effect will the One Belt, One Road initiative that we've been discussing, where China is expanding its view across the world, what effect or what participation might uh, America have in that strategy. So I'd like to replay just a little bit of that episode and then we translated uh, Fan Lin's answer which we missed at the very end of that episode and I thought that it was very important for our listeners to hear the response that Fan Lin had. Well this is actually very similar to the development philosophy, the international development philosophy of the United States, which we've been trying to practice to share prosperity and technology and people uh, with uh, all the countries of the world, um, especially since World War II. So I must say Beijing? that it is uh, truly inspiring at this time to see China joining America in their role in international development and what America and China can do together could be very exciting. Uh, 确实它的在国际上发挥着一定的这个影响力 呃，中国的这个经济实力的这个增强，那么呃，中中国的领导人也意识到了我们要通过更多的这种形式、更多的方法，然后去消除世界对中国的这种呃误解，然后让我们大家能够互相尊重我们不同的文化的这种这种呃
world development partners can have in implementing the One Belt, One Road policy internationally across the whole world. We understand the original concept of One Belt, One Road and how far it goes from China to the West. And now we're envisioning that belt coming all the way around the planet and with America as a potential partner. Uh, 而且作为两个全球的这个第一大经济体和第二大经济体在经济方面会有更多的一些共同的利益可以合作从一五年一六年这个两年的这个情况来看呢实际上美国和中国在科技在这个能源等方面已经展开了很多的合作那么我觉得
in terms of some policies, uh, we need the help of uh, governments in order to uh, uh, establish and uh, uh, put into practice these policies. Uh, the second level would be uh, the markets themselves. Uh, they play a huge uh, guiding road, role in terms of uh, uh, their demand. And uh, the third uh, aspect of it all would be uh, a social aspect, as you mentioned, uh, in terms of uh, private uh, capital uh, and uh, private investments. Uh, sure, there are also a lot uh, on uh, that level to be said. Uh, the most important thing, though, to understand is that it's not necessarily working on three different levels, but it's these three levels working uh, together for the common, uh, common promotion of the One Belt, One Road. And these three levels uh, also include America. Okay. Uh, I have a follow-up question. Uh, I've had a little experience in the international development field. And what's been discovered over the years with uh, U.S. development strategy is that sometimes the bottom-up is just as important as the top down. In other words, it's good to build railroads and ports and big hydroelectric dams, but one of the most important things you can do with a developing economy, for example, and I think China has found this, is if you educate women and you empower women to raise their children and give them understanding of how to raise their children in a healthy way, that can have the most profound effect on the economy and the future of a nation. And I wonder if that kind of thinking is figuring in the strategy that China has with the nations that it's engaging with across the world. Uh, 自主的这个权利其实是一个很古老的话题了从中国之间在不仅仅是在中国在全世界都是一个拿出来值得讨论的话题但是我相信我觉得现如今的在当今的中国社会里头其实女性已经在很多权利上都已经超越了我们男性所
Uh, Lee Anjun is, a, is an old friend and someone who uh, works, he's an economist, and he works with the Ministry of Commerce to identify opportunities for China's businesses and for China's uh, government agencies to make alliances across the world. He's work, worked directly in Africa and in Europe and in Central Asia, and he has a great deal of insight into the economic strategy behind the One Belt, One Road policy. So, Understanding the Belt and Road Initiative in one minute. How the Belt and Road Initiative will expand trade. Expanding global trade is one of the key priorities of the China proposed One Belt, One Road Initiative. The grand design took concrete shape when China agreed to a 45 billion US dollar investment in Pakistan, with most of the spending going to build the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Starting at Pakistan's Gwadar port on the Arabian Sea and ending at China's Xinjiang, the corridor will promote connectivity in the South Asian region and provide a shorter and cheaper route for trade with the Middle East and Africa. Statistics released by the China's Ministry of Commerce shows that during the first half of 2015, China has directly invested in 48 countries involved in the Belt and Road Initiative, with total investment volume reaching over 7 billion US dollars, a year-on-year -year increase of 22%. More trade potential will be tapped between countries along the route. At this year's Boao Forum for Asia in March, President Xi Jinping said China's annual trade with countries along the One Belt Run Road Initiative could reach 2.5 trillion US dollars in 10 years. Meanwhile, experts point out that to facilitate unimpeded trade, steps will be taken to resolve investment and trade facilitation issues, reduce investment and trade barriers, lower trade and investment costs, as well as to promote regional economic integration. So we're back now with Li Yanjun uh, from the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, he heads an organization that works within the Ministry of Commerce to advise the Premier of China and other uh, government agencies on the best strategy for China to have a positive impact across the world. So Yanjun is very familiar with the One Belt, One Road policy and its implementation. And I have a first question for you, Yan Jun. Um, do you know the amount of capital that China has identified that will be deployed over the next 10 years for the One Belt, One Road policy? Um, we've heard a number of estimates, and I'd like to hear what is, uh, what is your understanding as to the amount of, uh, of capital that will be coming from China to support the, the initiative? Like 海上丝绸之路的代名词就是亚洲经济的亚洲基础投资开发银行在各个国家的这个教育与科技技术啊基础设施全面开放的这种呃合作范围之内啊呃各个国家的这种经济发展 Nicholas, can you translate yes. so far? Yes, uh, so Mr. Li said that uh, today is the first uh, day that uh, the two sessions in China is uh, going to start, so it's a very uh, good topic to be talking about today. Uh, he says that 
uh, China's uh, One Belt, One Road initiative, as we know, has a, a, has a continental part and a maritime part uh, to it, and uh, that there are uh, about 65 countries investing in it. In terms of China's investment, uh, there are many different levels to it. Uh, obviously, there's the China Development Bank as well as the uh, Asian uh, uh, Infrastructure and Investment Bank that have been putting out a lot of capital and that will continue to do so. There are also many uh, commercial banks in China that have been putting out capital for the uh, strategy, such as China's Commercial Bank and China's Construction Bank and China's Agricultural Bank. Um, and this uh, cooperation in terms of investment, uh, China is obviously uh, putting out a lot, but it's uh, more something that will be done in cooperation with uh, uh, the other countries along the road under the guidance of uh, the Chinese government and the governments of these countries as well. So it's a, it's a cooperative effort between the government of China and other governments. I'm particularly interested in the example of Pakistan, which was one of the first really big projects that China engaged with, building a huge hydroelectric power plant in Pakistan. Wow. Now, obviously, Pakistan is an extremely important country, very large population, and at a crossroads in, uh, in Central Asia that involves China and India and Pakistan, the Islamic world. So I'm interested in Yan Jun's assessment of that project and how it's working um, to bring hydroelectric power to the people of Pakistan. And how it may work to bring stability to an area that that needs a good deal of attention. Uh 邻边国家包括巴基斯坦还有就是铁路运输方面进行加大投资力度在中国呢有一句俗话就叫做是想要富先修路那么我们更好的希望邻边的这些友好国家呢更能通过中国的这种支持建设能够实现人民的这种过上富裕的生活这是我们需要的 Mr. Lee says that China has uh, been investing and in the strategy of China to go out in the world and to implement its strategy uh, has a lot to do with uh, technology and environmental protection. In countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan and etc., um, China has been investing in technology and infrastructure in order to solve the uh, problem, the issue of providing uh, electricity for these people, in addition to uh, solving the problem of uh, infrastructure building, uh, transportation, uh, such as building roads, uh, railways. Uh, in these fields, China has been uh, greatly increasing investment. There is an old Chinese sentence, an old Chinese saying that says that if you want to get rich, you must first build roads. And uh, that is what uh, China is trying to do for these countries, trying to uh, build these roads that will connect these countries and its people together, uh, and then build the infrastructure, uh, which includes uh, this uh, dam, which you've mentioned, that will be able to uh, bring electricity to these people. That is how China is trying to help these countries uh, connect these countries and uh, invest in these countries. And Yanjun,我们在中国政府的主导下,以各个国家的政府之间的一种项目合作以及政策的一种衔接,更好的在税收体制,包括法律事务上,还有就是我们的货币支付体系上,能够达成一种协议,更好的就是能为我们的中小企
more with these countries in terms also of policies and to have uh, a lot of uh, bilateral um, preferential uh, policies in terms of, uh, for example, uh, currency and payment and uh, in order to help enterprises in each country uh, to uh, go global and uh, cooperate and invest and help each other. I have a follow-up question. I, I know that you have spent some time in Africa also um, looking into investments and projects there. Can you tell us of one example of a project uh, in the continent of Africa in which China is involved? Okay. Uh, no problem. Uh, uh,在,呃,该国进行,呃,土牢作业,啊,呃,建立工厂,提高非洲人民的这种生活。呃，绿色环保、农业、机械化这些方面，我们将会做呃重点的呃支持工作。Okay. Uh, Mr. Lee has said that uh, in countries, in many countries like Africa, for example, he mentioned Morocco. Uh, China has been helping to build uh, uh, factories uh, to improve the life uh, of the people over there. Uh, he says that the way that China uh, is currently supporting Africa has a lot to do with uh, building infrastructure, obviously, but also. Uh, with uh, helping the country to industrialize and uh, to uh, build itself, to develop itself. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there are also a lot of organic resources that uh, China uh, can exploit for uh, the African populations, and this is a way that uh, Africa, the continent of Africa, and China have been able to realize win-win uh, cooperation, win-win results, and win-win benefits. I think it will be fascinating in the coming years to see how the efforts of America and Europe to foster balanced development across the world start to mesh with the efforts of China to do the same thing. And we certainly hope that that will turn into a series of partnerships that will be much greater than the sum of its parts. And that the insights that those three big developing uh, groups have will be combined into something that's greater than the sum of its parts. So that's a theme that we'll keep exploring in understanding China. And I want to thank uh, Nicholas Bertiom, who is our translator for today. Uh, he comes to us from Beijing, Imoza, and we really thank uh, Beijing, Imoza, and Lin Fan Lin for their support of this program. I want to acknowledge the efforts of Xiaofang Zhou in Beijing as the producer and the efforts of David Castellano in Beijing in, in making it possible for the bits to move across the Pacific. And it certainly worked a lot, uh, a lot smoother this time, and we'll be back again soon with another episode of Understanding China.